Good morning, and you're very welcome on this bright sunny morning to our uh, Signpost webinar. Uh, our, the Signpost webinar is brought to you in association with uh, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, uh, Dairy Sustainability Ireland, and the National Rural Network. Uh, this morning, I'm joined uh, by co-host uh, Tom O'Dwyer. Tom, you're, you're very welcome. Thanks, Pat. And uh, this morning, we're delighted to, to have Dr. Andrew Cromley. Uh, Andrew is, is technical director with ICBF and has been working on uh, breeding indices uh, with Chagas and with ICBF for, I suppose, about 20 years now, Andrew, uh, and has been one of the the leading figures behind what I think has been one of the great successes of Irish agriculture has been in, in the development of the those breeding indices and the impact that they've had on, on Irish agriculture. Andrew, you're really welcome. Thank you very much, Pat. Andrew, you might just give us a little bit of, of background to the, the, the work you've been uh, doing uh, with ICBF over those years and, and where it's Yeah, been. look, uh, yeah, thanks, Pat. No, I'm sure I'm with ICBF from the start, which is uh, over, well, it's almost 25 years now. It's over 20 years I'm in Cork. So, um, But obviously from the early days of just uh, pulling the data together into the central database, I suppose, look, the big projects in the early days was really the, the EBA was the seminal project, the key project. Uh, I mean, we know the background there, the challenges we were facing and you know, look, there was a lot of really good research then done in, in, in Moore Park, still is obviously now, but uh, but uh, then working with, with the advisory service and the extension, really getting that whole EBI message out through to farms. And, you know, they were um, uh, they were challenging times, but also very, very exciting times. And, and as you say there, Pat, at the start, you know, uh, absolutely no doubt that, uh, you know, it, it is simply delivered uh, for, for, for dairy farmers. And look, we're just... Now and we're delivering the same principles and on on beef and and now we're we're into the the challenging one of dairy beef and and promoting dairy beef integration. I'll touch on that later on and and of course one of the big challenges we have now is is the whole area of greenhouse gases and how we integrate those into the into the into our indexes. But as you can see from my title slide, I'm looking upon these as opportunities. So all very positive still. Yeah, and and I suppose the history of all the indices is that they're they they are moving targets. The 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 things that we're aiming at all the time have, have have moved right since the beginning. And that causes frustration because farmers like we live in a world where we like exactness, you know. And uh, but uh, you know that uh, you know our our responsibility is to make sure that farmers are well well aligned for what's coming in the future. And that'll cause some temporal changes to the bulls we picked last year. And now they've changed a bit and causes a bit of frustration, et cetera. But I think our, our track record is, 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 is one of delivery now in, in this space now. So. And, and second to none. Okay, listen, without further ado, if you want to, you're, you've uh, shared your screen, if you want to just go into presentation mode and, and take it away. Thanks again. Okay, Andrew. thanks. And, and look, delighted to be on the, the signpost uh, farm. A series uh, to have the opportunity to talk with the group. Um, look, as I uh, alluded to there, uh, Pat, I, I really looking at the role of breeding and addressing these uh, greenhouse gas mitigation opportunities that are very much focused on, on opportunities. Um, so in terms of what we're going to cover over the course of the next 25 minutes, half an hour is, uh, you know, it, it's obviously just uh, looking back in terms of what are the current indexes delivered. But then really to look at some of the new opportunities for the future. Uh, and we're going to spend a bit of time talking about carbon sub-indexes. So people are well aware of, you know, fertility sub-index or beef sub-index or whatever. So new sub-indexes around carbon, carbon traits. Then this is the one that's probably get most attention or a lot of attention at the moment, the opportunity to select directly for methane traits that you could actually have animals that, you know, emit less methane. We're going to talk about some of the data we have now on that. A lot of interest at the moment around earlier finishing age. Can we actually breed for animals that will finish younger? And of course, the answer to that is yes. And then I'm going to touch on two broader initiatives, one around carbon farming models, which is work again we're doing with Chagas and Borbia. And then I'm going to talk about, um, you know, a, a bigger project in many way, ways, which we're presenting very much as a cross-cutting initiative which has the potential to benefit everyone, which is genotyping the national cattle herd. And within that, there's a there's a positive um, a positive aspect we need to pick up around dairy beef integration. 
Um, and then maybe just to finish off on some of the key decisions for dairy and beef farmers this spring. So maybe just looking back, uh, you know, Pat, and you were alluding to the early days of the EBA. Yep, this is where we came from. Um, you know, high indexed Holstein animals, not the answer. You know, they had lots of milk solids, but really, really disappointing female fertility. This has gone back to the early 2000s. You know, lots of people in the seminar will remember these days, the frustrations it caused, etc. Um, but it was then based on solid science. And I would have to say, you know, that's the way ICBF have worked. It's based on understanding the problem, working in closely with Chagas and others to understand the science but behind addressing the problem. So, you know, lots of really excellent research work in Chagas over many years, including the early Curtin's farm work. And, and then being able to then deliver in terms of the, the, the change that was required and then the sustained improvements in profitability that we see as a consequence. So, you know, these are the, the heifers that we're calving back in, 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 in the early 2000s. And the orange line here is the rate again in EBA. It's increasing by about uh, 10 euros per year. Um, in overall terms, it's been worth, you know, four or five cents per liter for dairy farmers between the heifers they're calving in this year relative to the same heifer, the heifers they calved in 15 years ago. So, you know, um, as a consequence, people have great confidence and faith in EBA as a simply a, a tool or a, uh, that's, that's delivering on farm year and year. And it's driven off, you know, these, uh, you know, when we look at the, and this is an analysis, looking at the high EBA herds versus average versus low EBA herds and the sort of performance that's uh, being achieved in those herds. And of course, the one that we're also interested in now is, and this is linking through with the Borbia carbon footprint data, you can see that these high EBI herds also have a lower carbon footprint, 1.04 uh, kilograms of CO2 e per kilogram of fat and protein compared for the low EBI herds compared to 0.9. So it's certainly confirming that the high EBI herds are more carbon uh, efficient. And whenever we do the sums on this, and, and this is you know what's there in the Chagas Mac curve, you know, uh, that's the sort of mitigation potential. So when we talk about a four and a half to six and a half million pound target for the industry, uh, EBA trends, those current EBA trends could deliver uh, about 650 kilotons. And it's the same uh, principle for beef, you know, the frustration and anger felt by beef farmers whenever all of a sudden there was a new science-based metric brought into the beef data and genomics program We're back in 2014. You know, a lot of angry farmers in, in, in Claire Morris. I mean, um, was it was it just were, were, were their concerns justified? Yes, they were, um, because probably at that stage, the whole area of genetics and genomics and beef was still quite new. But I suppose, again, it was based on the knowledge that was really solid science here that we were confident that by by starting to move farmers towards these higher genetic merit animals, particularly for the maternal traits which was where we were having the problem uh, that we would ultimately result in animals that were going to be more profitable and more carbon efficient for, for beef farmers. And look, that has, uh, that has shown itself as well. The genetic trends, which were going in the wrong direction for milk and fertility in our suckler beef herd have now completely turned around. And, and it's also clear that the higher genetic merit uh, as in replacement index, further replacement index, those higher genetic merit herds and beef um, also have um, the uh, uh, I just put the pointer on there also have the lower carbon footprint. So you can see these um, high replacement there index beef herds. You know they have a lighter ca cow, um, 650 compared to 690. A heavier calf, more efficient, better fertility, a lower carbon footprint. And when we do the sums on that index. You know, we can see the potential to mitigate 181 kilotons of the um, of that uh, national target. So, what does this mean in overall terms? You know, and I appreciate there's a lot, quite a, a few numbers here, but I'm, I'm just really going to zone in on where we are currently versus where we need to go to. And, and this is one of the challenges that I know in communication, uh, communicating the benefits of breeding has been difficult. Because the way breeding has got presented in the context of the MAC, the Chagas MAC curve, 
the Mac core works on the basis of for these efficiency measures having a cap on output. That's the way it can best capture uh, the the efficiency gains. Now that assumes then that you know you're able to by capping output and by having more productive animals with a lower carbon footprint, effectively you can keep fewer animals. So you're fixing output and keeping fewer animals. And that's as a, as a result of that, you get this 658 kiloton reduction in, in, in uh, CO2E um, from selection on EDA and 181 from selection on the replacement index. It's really by virtue of largely being able to keep pure animals. But that hasn't been the case. We haven't fixed output, as you know, in our agri industry. I mean, we've continued to grow our output, and that's a positive uh, for all of the reasons we, we can identify on. And, and we've largely, there's been a lot of talk about a stable herd. So, and we have largely approached a stable herd across dairy and beef. And in that scenario, you can see that the current EBA trends really don't mitigate a lot. Uh, and that's simply because, you know, if we keep the cow numbers constant, well, we're generating more output, as in kilograms of uh, carcass weight or fat and protein kilogram or fat and protein. And that additional gain in output needs more feed and fertilizer. So we're in, so from a, um, we call it an overall perspective, we're, we're getting very little net gain in, 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 in uh, our CO2E. So as a result of that, we're then having to move from what we call these enabling measures, measures that enable efficiency gains, to actually looking at measures that will result in a direct reduction in CO2E. So we're actually starting to move towards, for example, breeding for animals that will have a lower methane, you know, at the animal level. So that's where our focus has moved to. And I'm going to cover that over the course of the next number of slides, these direct measures. But when we do that, and we've done this work with Tagus and an outside consultant we've worked closely with down for many years, Abacus Bio, um, we can still see that we can mitigate a million tons off the four and a half to six and a half million ton target. But it will require us to zone in on, you know, new traits, new areas, new opportunities. So there will be a level of change coming, but it's with the confidence that, um, you know, that we can uh, certainly uh, look to um, work towards and help to mitigate uh, CO2E uh, across our agri-food industry. So taking the car, the first one is an example and the work that we're currently doing with Chagas around a new carbon sub-index. So people are familiar on the call with the EBA and you have a milk sub-index, a fertility sub-index. Um, you have, you know, the maintenance part, the beef part, et cetera. And this just gives you a sense of what's currently happening with the EBA. So yes, we are reducing down um, emissions by selecting more on higher EBA animals on average do have a lower carbon emissions per lactation. Okay, and that's a positive. So it, that's consistent with the, what we were showing earlier on, that it's, it's still reducing down, but not as much as if we had a cap on output. Um, and that's the sort of order of reduction that you can see uh, in terms of the reduction in CO2E that we're currently getting in the EBA. I suppose what we are looking at doing is putting more weighting on the sort of carbon traits within the existing EBA. And you might just say, well, what are the carbon traits that are there within the existing EBA? And it's really the female fertility traits. So by putting more weighting on the female fertility traits within the current EBA, effectively what you're able to do is be in a position for to, for example, carry fewer replacements. That's a good example of, and as a consequence, we need fewer dairy replacement stock on our inventory. And there are benefits of that associated then with having an, a lower overall uh, output in terms of greenhouse gases. So that's one example of by putting more um, weighting on the female fertility traits, we can certainly accelerate the gain or accelerate that reduction in CO2. And it's by the order of doubling that rate again from sort of the current 0.3% per year to about 0.6% per year. Now that will cause some level of re-ranking 
It will also take us away from our optimum around profitability. We're saying that potentially there's a, if you were to compare that with an index that's focused purely on profit, you're looking at a, a 15% reduction. But that's in the expectation that carbon in itself is going to be a trade of economic value in the future. So certainly confident that that's something that's going to be able to take us in the right direction. So the second area that we're working closely on is the whole area of breeding for lower methane animals. And again, this is work that we're doing in uh, our performance test station in Tully in County Kildare, where we're actually bringing animals in. These are all progeny of AI sires that are involved in the Gene Ireland breeding program. Important to appreciate, it's just not beef animals, it's beef, it's dairy beef, it's dairy animals, steers, heifers, that we're bringing in and then we're measuring their feed growth, feed intake and efficiency, and also crucially, their um, uh, methane output per day, grams per day, and obviously working closely with, with Chagas and others in the, you know, the analysis and interpretation of this data. So what are we seeing? On average, animals will admit during their finishing period about 250 grams per day. But there's also very clear evidence of differences between these animals between animals, between systems, between breeds in terms of the, 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 their level of methane emissions. And whenever we start to look at this, and this is a, an initial analysis, looking at some test EDVs for dairy AI sires whose progeny have gone through Tully. So each of these dots are based on progeny from AI sires, their steer progeny, that have now gone through Tully, okay? So, you know, we have uh, three, two or 300 uh, dairy steers that have also gone through Tully at this stage. So here we're looking at the average methane output grams per day of those steers and based on and generating genetic evaluations for the, for the whole data set. But then crucially looking at what sort of variation are we seeing here for these different groups of AI sires. And this is the EBI of those AI sires, so bulls, and this is his, you know, these are the animals that have been in the breeding program over the course, Gene Ireland breeding program over the course of the last, you know, five, eight years. And yet you can see sires in there with EBIs, 200, 250, 300, but also crucially, we're seeing sires that are really nice variation here in their grams of methane per day. And it's obviously these sires down at the bottom that we're really interested in. Can we have high EBI? but also with a 10% lower methane grams per day. And I mean, that's where the real opportunity is. You know, we can start to have these high EBI animals that have good milk solids and good fertility. You know, it's these sires down here that we really want to be using in the future in the breeding program, because they then give us confidence that we're going to be able to reduce down our methane per day uh, in the animals that are going to be coming through each year, each generation, and for the next 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years into the future. So it's very, very positive initial results. You know, and, and a, certainly at this stage, we are looking at potentially generating these and, and applying through into our beef indexes because this data is based largely then on, on, on a finishing diet. So we're looking at potentially bringing this into our beef indexes there and 2022, 2023. Question has been raised, well, what about dairy? And it's it's still, look, it's too early in dairy. You know, obviously we're looking at in animals on an indoor finishing diet. Um, big questions there around, well, how does this relate to a dairy cow relative to an animal on a finishing diet? It might be a, a dairy steer on a finishing diet, but also how does it relate to a grass-based diet versus, a, for example, an indoor diet? So, so these are big research questions, and, and we're involved now with, with Chagas and others in, in a number of big research projects to really up our ambition around how we collect more methane data, including on berry cows and on grass, to be able to generate genomic predictions for methane traits for, um, you know, for our, our, our dairy and dairy beef and beef herd. And, and ultimately, the plan is to to have those good genomic predictions that we can genotype young animals and apply then into the breeding program and be able to identify these animals with this real methane mitigation potential in the future. I'm going to talk a wee bit about age at slaughter now, because that's a trait that there's a lot of discussion and interest in. Um, 
you know, what perhaps people haven't appreciated that we have been made, making really steady progress on reducing down age at slaughter, about 45 days since to, uh, 2010, including, you know, very significant reductions in the last uh, in the last 12 months, you know, especially. And that's probably a small bit of a hangover from, you know, COVID and, 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 and you know, factory blockade late 2019. All of these have ripple effects through in terms of throughput. But certainly there's a momentum now building around an earlier finishing agent. And if you look at, for example, suckler bred steers going back over 10 years, you can see consistently, if we go back to 2012, 2015, 2018, now 2020, 2022, 21, 20, and now 2022, you can really see, you know, we've been able to make, we've been making consistent reductions in age at slaughter. And that's continuing through into the 22 a year to date, date. So very positive gains there. And I suppose the question is being raised, well, can we actually go faster uh, to help achieve these greenhouse gas targets? And the simple answer to that is, is yes, but we do need to uh, move towards science-based approaches to, to being able to quantify the gross emissions that an animal is generating um, in, during its lifetime. And if you think about how we might do that, well, there was some really nice work presented there by uh, Paul Crossan at the Chagas Beef Conference there in November, where he highlighted the point that it's just not about age at slaughter, uh, and the point that he was drawing out there was whenever Chagas and Grange and compared two groups of animals, one group of animals that were slaughtered at 28 months on a grass only diet compared to another group of animals that were slaughtered four months or earlier, but with a, a grass and concentrates diet, well, actually you see the gross emissions here, CO2E for both groups of animals was about four tons per animal. So even though these animals were four ton, four months earlier in terms of age at slaughter, the additional cost of the concentrates, feed and fertilizer, et cetera, resulted in the same gross emissions. So there's a really important point here about having science-based metrics and understanding the systems that animals are in to really maximize uh, the opportunities around reducing uh, are promoting an earlier finishing age. And that's where we've been working with Chagas and Abacus Bio again to to develop out this animal carbon footprint or a gross emissions for every animal in the database. Uh, and we have now applied that for animals that have been slaughtered over the course of the last five years. And this is just looking at data from uh, 2021, the prime cattle kill of 1.3 million animals. And it's really interesting to look at if you even take, for example, these steers here, 663,000 steers, about 10% of steers are really slaughtered in no, no system as such. They're sort of, they go through multiple movements and they end up in the factory, slaughtered at 335 months and 380 kilos. But look, they're generating 6.7 tons of emissions CO2E in their lifetime. And if we compare that with, for example, a very efficient system, which is steer slaughtered off grass in the second summer, at this end of the second summer, you know, there's a difference there of three tons, um, uh, over three tons, three and a half, three point seven tons in terms of gross emissions. So these were the real opportunities are to to help to promote a, an earlier finish need. Because if we can do that, well, then we can certainly mitigate off uh, additional um, greenhouse gases from our from our from our national inventory. And we've done a nice bit of work again with with, with Chagas to understand what are the the potential opportunities here. And it is really about understanding these systems and being able to, for example, address these animals that are in no system as such, and at least get them into finishing off grass in the third summer or finished out of the house in that second winter. Um, or alternatively, looking at ways to promote or get encourage farmers to, instead of finishing off grass in the third summer, can we, can we finish animals off grass in the second summer? or even those opportunities around one month gains within your system through better technical efficiency. And if you do that sort of exercise for, for steers and over a period of time, there's the opportunity to mitigate off 400 kilotons, a gain off that four and a half million to six and a half million ton target. And um, you know, whenever we apply in both the heifers and the young bulls into that, well, there's certainly 800 kilotons then that can be mitigated off. 
And again, there, there's an important point in all of that, that, um, you know, uh, these are repeatable. So every time you move another 100,000 uh, animals, say, for example, into that finished off grass in the second summer, or as you get another month again on the technical efficiency, you know, that 800 can become a million, could become 1.2 million, uh, again, off that four and a half million ton target. And, um, you know, there's an important point that the momentum is here on this one. You know, the, the, the trends are positive. So now what we're looking at are, are really the enabling factors that will help to drive this uh, faster. And these are just some of the factors we're working with, um, Chagas and others, to, to bring forward, working closely with Dunaberry and his team around new genetic evaluations for an earlier finishing age. So in addition to the growth traits that are taking us in the right direction, could we actually go faster by additionally selecting on, on and promoting earlier finish? Uh, and of course, the answer to that is yes. We rolled out a new commercial beef value. Um, DNA calf registration is something that has real potential. I'll touch on that towards the end. As a sex semen, some of the people on the call might have picked up on the, the new beef benchmarking reports, which we're currently piloting with ABP around these gross emissions at the animal level. And they are now available for all animals in the database. And our goal is to roll those across out to all beef farmers through the meat processors over the course of the next six, nine, 12 months. And of course, there are various industry initiatives that are happening at the moment, whether they're Department of Agriculture, EU, RDP type programs, or engagement and industry and uh, industry initiatives. So there's lots of momentum building around earlier finishing age, and it's certainly one that we believe is, is, is has a lot of potential. Another one which just to draw attention to is the whole area of carbon farming. You know, in the past, we've been very, very focused on carbon footprinting. And obviously, we've been working closely over the course of the last, well, particularly over the course of the last six, nine months with both Borbia and with Chagas. So again, unknowns to many, ICBF and the database, instead of us providing the data to Borbia and, and them crunching the numbers for the based on the Chagas carbon footprint model, we now do the back end work from an ICPF standpoint. And it, it's just, it makes more sense. It's a better fit. It's a better service in terms of support. Um, and, and, and it's a good example of the stakeholders working closely to provide these carbon footprint data uh, through to farmers now. So we did that successfully in dairy in October time. We're now in the process of repeating it for beef um, with the goal of having that available during the, 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 the summertime. Um, so that's the, the, the way it, it's working now. I suppose in terms of how we see this moving more and more in the future, it's about automating those data feeds around feed and fertilizer. There's new, as you know, um, talk of feed, um, sorry, fertilizer registers. The importance of having strong validated data now flowing into these carbon footprints is going to be absolutely crucial. And the other thing that's going to be crucial, we will talk, continue to talk about carbon footprinting. But more importantly, we have to start to talk about gross emissions at the farm level. So that's the total emissions. And, and if we can do that, because carbon footprinting, remember, assumes that we're really, you know, capping output. Go back to the very discussion we had at the start. No, we now need to talk about total emissions and get farmers understanding the total emissions that are on their farm. So if it's a million tons, he's finding ways of, well, how can I get it down to 900 or 800? And then it's not a discussion about simply reducing down cows. It's a discussion about the measures, for example, that are in the MAC that are going to give me an extra 50. There's another 80 there. Uh, there's another 20 if I do that. So that's the discussion. So there'll be a big push now towards um, moving the whole conversation towards understanding and appreciating the gross emissions, because that's what the inventory calculates or looks at. It's gross emissions. That's what we have to reduce, four and a half million to six and a half million tons. So we need our farmers and our industry talking in the same language. We're going to finish off by talking about just one last, uh, uh, as I would call it, the, the cross-cutting measure, which is genotyping out the national cattle hair. Look, and there are so many benefits to this, simply in terms of our opportunity to increase genetic gain. And we know that um, by having more animals genotyped, by tidying up the parentage errors, by having more accurate data, it simply helps us to identify better the outliers for the breeding program. 
And as a consequence of that, we can accelerate our gain above what we're currently doing by on the order of 20%. The other big benefit that we can see straight away is once you have your herd genotype, whether it's a dairy herd or a beef herd, as you come in with these carbon sub-indexes, these direct measurements of methane, you immediately get a very good picture of where this is herd is at from a from a, a, a greenhouse gas perspective. And you do that with 100% surety around the ancestry. There, there, as we all know, there, there is no messing with the DNA, you know, there's no vagueness, that's it. And you know exactly where this hair is at. So any future carbon farming or carbon auditing, uh, you know, will, will, will certainly benefit hugely from having a really accurate picture of where the hair is at. And then, of course, there's lots of other benefits in terms of, you know, uh, dairy, in terms of um, genotyping, whether it's helping to promote greater dairy beef integration. Enhanced traceability, we led, I suppose, the discussions around traceability in the past uh, through our, our identification and registration systems. But look, others have caught up on that. But can we now introduce genotyping as a, as a way to really talk about enhanced, enhanced traceability? There's lots of other benefits around labor saving. R&D, a market point of difference, very hard to others to, to mimic uh, what we might be able to do in this space in terms of from our, our dairy and beef processing perspective. So look, there's a very positive and active discussion around transitioning our national cattle here to be in to, to, to be in DNA-based calf registration. And look, there's real wins for government and, and, and industry in that regard. And there's good discussions then and in terms of what it might cost and how we might share those costs, et cetera. And these are then just one um, you know, just one example. I, I, I wanted to pick up the dairy beef integration one because I know in the audience today. We have um, obviously people coming from a dairy background and a beef background as well as others. And I mean, two of the big challenges on dairy beef integration is, is, is for the rearer knowing what he's getting. And that's one of the big, I suppose, uh, issues that impacts confidence among calf rearers. You know, the surety of what he's buying, that when he buys that calf in the ring or off a farmer, that he's, he'd like more surety as to what he's getting. And obviously the genotyping, and the genetic mirror uh, linked to that at birth will, will help provide that. Um, and of course, the second one then is the question the dairy farmers are asking, well, can we have both? Can we have air, easy calving and with a good calf? And of course, the answer to that is yes. And genotyping will help us identify those outliers for the breeding program so that we can identify beef bulls that um, will be easy calving and short gestation, but with a decent calf. And the other one that dairy farmers perhaps aren't even thinking about really at this stage, but it comes up all the time in conversation. You know, it's this trade-off then between, you know, they want a light cow, but they also understand that they can't have too light a calf. You need enough of the growth traits in there to get a decent calf. And whether that's on a dairy meal calf or the dairy beef calf. But again, genotyping is such an important way to help us to identify those sort of outlier animals for the breeding program that break the correlation between, we'll call it, um, you know, that cow size and the size of her calf, you know. Um, so that's where the real opportunities are. And to finish, look, I, I know it was, a, it always comes up, you know, well, what do we need to do this spring? You know, this is um, a well versed, uh, you know, few points, understand who you are, understand what you want to breed, get your team of AI bulls and breed from your best cows. You know, that's what's there currently, whether it's dairy or beef. I suppose if I was to talk about what's going to be there maybe next spring, and I say spring 2023, yeah, we're going to be working towards that new carbon sub-index in, uh, in, in the EBA. That opportunity around new meat entries for the beef index is based on tonny data and certainly an early finish sub-index across all of the indexes. So there's a real momentum now start to build around um, greenhouse mitigation opportunities. Um, you know, across our dairy and beef herd. So to summarize, uh, Tom, Chairman, um, yeah, genetics is delivering, um, you know, in terms of uh, profitability, sustainability, climate and environment, as I said at the earlier, you know, the goalposts have sh shifted, but even after shifting the goalposts more towards these mitigation traits now, we're very confident that uh, ICBF, sorry, ICBF breeding, the industry, we can, deliver off a million tons of mitigation of that four and a half to six and a half million ton target. And we're also very confident that by working closely with all stakeholders, 
there's certainly another million tons there available around the earlier fish finishing. And I would uh, also suggest that, you know, we're going to more and more be talking about gross emissions. That's going to become the new carbon metric at farm level. And, and we'll obviously continue to work. be working very closely with Chagas Bordia and others to deliver that out. And the last one is that one around genotyping. It's a cross-cutting measure that has the potential to deliver for all stakeholders in many, many areas, but also including, crucially, that greenhouse gas mitigation. So thank you very much, Tom, and uh, happy to, yeah, to take any questions. Okay, uh, Andrew, if you just uh, st stop sharing your, yeah, that's that's great. Listen, uh, anybody who might have thought that you were resting on your laurels of success in in, in previous indices and, and don't have much to do, I think uh, there's a, 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 a an indication that uh, a hell of a lot going on and a hell of a lot more work to, to do in the area. And really, thank you very much for a really illuminating uh, 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 presentation there. So it's just one question, uh, first of all, and just remind people to put their questions in the, the Q&A. There's a good few questions coming in there. But in terms of our ability to incorporate uh, the gains that that are that we have the potential to make here in the national inventories that, and to get them counted as uh, um, as as gains so that we stop using the the, the standards uh, and the defaults uh, I, I presume the type of science and this type of data you are generating will enable that to happen yeah and and um, look we're in um... Good discussions with Chagas and the EPA around the national inventory models and how can we actually make sure if we're starting to uh, generate genetic gain, for example, on these methane mitigation traits, how can that actually be reflected then through into the inventory? I mean, what's crucial there is, one, it has to be solid science, peer-reviewed, validated and repeatable, you know, including, you know, being able to back calculate and we're in a very, very fortunate position with, with data and databases and genetics to be able to do that, because really what you're talking about there is once you can demonstrate that you're, you're, you're making an improvement on something, well, then effectively what you're doing, uh, Chairman, is, is updating those emission factors then on an annual basis. So if you're making improvements in the emission factors, which you can demonstrate through your validation, well, then that's cap capturing, that gets updated then in the national inventory model on an annual basis. And you're able to capture the benefits of the lower emitting animals then in that way, as, and it's the same for the other traits. So that's the, the approach we would take. And certainly we're having good uh, discussions with Chagas and the EPA and the department in that regard, but very confident that they will be realized. It's a, it's a legitimate concern that people raise, uh, but uh, that's how they'd be realized, John. Tom, a lot of questions coming in. Yeah, uh, for sure, Pat. And um, again, I echo your comments to remind uh, our participants this morning, if they want to ask a question, to put it up on the, the Q&A uh, tab. Andrew, the first thing, just maybe an observation from myself. Uh, I, I think it's really, really great and uh, significant that you're talking about gross emissions. Um, and I suppose my, my question related to that, um, how soon do you think that um, ICBF might be in a position to present a gross emissions figure as, as you've described to individual dairy and beef farmers? Yeah, so, so, um, so first of all, it's there. It's just, it's not talk. It's, it's not the metric we've talked about, you know? Yeah. So the Chagas uh, carbon footprint model which we are now running, you know, doing the sums for, which Borbia are reporting. Uh, the gross emissions is there. It's just not being reported because it was almost like people had a fear of talking about gross emissions. You know, it was easier to talk about carbon footprint because it was aligned with the market. It was aligned where, where we were at as an industry. But the discussion now has moved on, as we all know. It's about total emissions. So we have to now get farmers and the industry talking about total emissions. And that's one of the benefits we've seen of, um, you know, even the bit of work that we have done with the meat processing industry around um, those, those gross emissions at the animal level. All of a sudden, farmers understand that, you know, um, it's quite simple. Um, every, if I can bring from a finished off grass uh, in the third summer to finished off grass in the second summer, that's two tons of emissions. All oh, right, okay. If I do that across a million animals, 
You know, that's two million tons. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's about presenting this stuff in, in, in language that farmers understand so mm-hmm. that whenever we start to promote and talk about, you know, why we need to move your herd from a million down to, you know. So, so Tom, that's, it's really crucial mm-hmm. that we start to move towards gross emissions. Excellent. Okay. And uh, a question then from, from Michael, um, he, he, he highlights or he comments on the fact that you highlight in your presentation that in, in breeding, there's going to be trade-offs. Um, and he highlights the trade-off between perhaps fertility and maintenance versus beef merit. And I think you, you refer to it yourself in your presentation. And he, he wonders in his question whether perhaps in that trade-off, whether to date we've maybe erred a little bit too much on the side of fertility and maintenance and have lost some of the beefing merit uh, as a result. That's his question. So would you like yeah, to it's a, it, it, It's a fair point. And, you know, um, yeah, and, and look, that that's, has been one of the challenges in, you know, as we focused really around that dairy efficiency piece, which is driven off a smaller cow live weight, et cetera, the, the a casualty in that regard is, is obviously the, 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 the calf. So there is a bit of rebalancing there required. Um, and But then again, in doing the rebalancing, we also do have to appreciate that we do want a smaller cow. You know, from a carbon perspective, they do emit less feces. But we do want to make sure that when getting a smaller cow, we also have a decent calf because mm-hmm. that's crucial for the dairy beef integration piece. And I suppose, Tom, that's where you know, we can be quite crude and maybe we've been quite crude about these sort of differences and, and trying to get that trade off in the past. Uh, but that's where genotyping and as I said, trying to identify these outliers for the breeding program becomes crucial because I remember, and you'll remember in the early days of the EBI, people didn't think you could get high yield and good fertility. If you had high yield, you had fertility problems. That was the discussion. But of course, the breeding program and genotyping helped us to break the correlation to find the outliers. And that's exactly what we now need to do in this trade-off between cow size and, and the calf. And genotyping will be key to that. And continuing then on the fertility one, Andrew, um, and you, you've said yourself in your presentation that um, there will be an increased focus on, on the fertility sub-index. Is, is there a point at which... Um, it's it's not possible to produce uh, to inc- improve uh, fertility further. You know, you yeah. you get the ninety percent cows calved in six weeks. You have the less than ten percent empty rate. Um, you know, how how much yeah. further can you improve it? Yeah. So so look, we're, we're not there as an industry at this stage, Tom. As you well know, like our, our six week calving rate is still what's the 68 percent. So we've still gains to be made on the female fertility piece. Uh, it is about compactness of cabin and also being able to hold and carry less replacements. But at any point in time, you hit a, to a certain extent, you, you know, the incremental gains from that trait uh, reduce. And, um, and, but certainly in the short term, we'd see more weighting going in on the female fertility. In the medium to longer term, Tom, that'll get replaced by then the direct selection for methane. So we've got the fertile cow and she's actually producing less methane. Okay. Or we have the animal that's able to finish earlier because it's another good example of a biological, you know, there's a point where you don't want to go any yeah. younger. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because you need carcass growth. You need to get them to a minimum carcass weight. Mm. But when you start to approach that limit, it's all about then the direct uh, measurement, you know, the, the, also then the animals that have lower methane. Uh, okay. And that's the... You know, there's a two steps to this whole process in many ways, Tom. It's first okay. looking at the carbon traits, but then following quickly then with the direct measurement of the okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So another question that, that features in the, in the Q&A um, um, is in relation to the genomic testing, which you highlighted as an enabling uh, technology. And um, I suppose you, you've been taught, you and ICBF have been t- talking about this for a few years now, Andrew, you know, this, it's not today or yesterday the talk of genomically testing that the, the national herd has has, has commenced. Um, the question that I, I note in the chat um, is, is around the cost. Uh, what, what's that uh, technology likely to cost farmers? Who's going to meet that cost? And there's there's kind of a, a, a third part to the question in relation to if, if that cost is, is to be borne, say, by the by the, uh, the dairy farmer or the animal breeders, maybe. 
um, you know, and, and the benefit is to the industry, you know, so the, the, the person who's finishing the animal or the beef processor or the overall industry benefits, is, is that fair that the cost is carried by the person who carries out the test, I think is, is, is what's meant by the question. So, yeah. Yeah, look, and I'll answer the question, you, maybe even the third part first, because it, that, that wouldn't be fair. You know, there are multiple beneficiaries, including the state, you know, you know, our, 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 our mitigation is about, uh, you know, the, what's been levied there on agriculture is the four and a half to million of a national target. So if our industry, sorry, if our government, and we know our, our, there's a transition in discussion in terms of low carbon economies, this is a good example of something that is a piece of infrastructure that can really help to kickstart that. So there's certainly a, a state part to the discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, the initial feedback we've gotten got from our Department of Agriculture has, has been positive in that regard. Similarly, there's a broader beef and dairy industry benefit, which they're acknowledging and seeing from, a, you know, a, again, how we present and position the, our, our product in international markets um, from a, a carbon perspective. Um, the enhanced traceability cannot be understated. It still is the number one issue. Uh, traceability for 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 our, our processing industry, and of course, then there are the farmer benefits. You know, in terms of accelerated gain, labour saving, all of that sort of stuff. And um, in terms of the cost, I suppose our sense of it, Tom, if we could really get momentum towards um, genotyping out the national cattle herd, starting, say, for example, in 2023, you know, and and, and over a three-year period. Well, the first thing to, to note is farmers are already paying, those that are in DNA cam registration, they're about, about five euros, but they pay that for their tag and the postage in and out of the samples. Mm. So that then becomes a very, very strong component of the overall cost of genotyping. There's five euro contribution there for farmers. And bear in mind, you have to get the tag. You have to do the tagging anyway, you know, mm. but now we're getting the tag and the DNA off the farm. Um, and then our best sense of what the additional cost after that is probably if we can do it at scale, it's in the order of 10 euros, you know? So now we're looking at 10 euros to talk to the broader government, dairy, meat processing industry, for example, uh, about how we might find some equitable shared funding model that would acknowledge the farmer's five euro contribution through his tag and his postage. And then, well, we have another 10 euros to find. And, you know, I accept it gets into a big figure. It's 30 million euros per annum, you know, two and a half million calves or thereabouts, 25 million. But we also know that there's lots and lots of benefits. And when we do the sort of cost benefits off it, you know, there's a three, four to one return on that investment easily from a broad industry perspective. Um, uh, two two other questions then. W- one is you, you mentioned twenty twenty three, so so obviously uh, discussions are ongoing. Um, but you know, are we that close to having? Are we potentially that close to having a, a national genotyping for uh, calves? Do you think? Uh, twenty twenty three would be ambitious. It would require a lot of engagement, buy in, support. I mean, even at that, you would be looking when I say twenty twenty three. If you were to get something going in 2023, it would be over a three to four year period. You would bring in, you know, maybe you might find yourself, you know, you bring in 10, five or eight, 10,000 herds in 2023, 28,000 herds in 2024, mm. the same again in 2025. Mm. But by the time you'd get to 2026, you'd yeah. have a full 70,000 herds that are generating calves in oh. DNA cap Okay. Approach it. Yeah. Andrew, okay. so just yeah. one thing that's come in there. We're we're in a time of of uh, I suppose change with with uh, uh, policy coming in. Are there policy enablers that that and uh, our policy initiatives uh, or modifications of of schemes that are there that could help in in propelling us forward? Are there there recommendations that you might have there? Yeah, look, uh, it's a good, I know, no, Pat, it's a good question. I mean, obviously the beef data and genomics program is there and there's a, a significant g- genotyping component to that. I suppose there's certainly, there's a lot of new developments coming through now at the moment around this whole, for example, earlier finish, uh, finishing and, and there's good discussions there about how they could, how could something like that integrate into a, a future 
you know, EU RDP funded program, uh, how it might le- link in with industry initiatives. They've already started as well with the meat processing industry. So there, there certainly, yes, is the, the simple answer to that, Pat. But again, it was, you know, it, it'll need the relevant stakeholders to sit down and, and prioritize. And look, the Food Vision Group, for example, that are meeting at the moment, the dairy group has met, and I under- our understanding is there's going to be a beef and sheep group, there's going to be other groups, you know, it's that those types of forums where people are going to have to make the tough decisions around, you know, well, how are we going to approach, you know, we have a target to, to hit and, and uh, what are the projects or the areas we're going to approach and what do we expect them to deliver and what are they going to cost? And, and certainly we believe this is one measure that has lots of multi-stakeholder stakeholder benefit. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's sometimes hard to get the financial support for it. If there was one beneficiary, you can go straight to them and say, uh, you know, this is a, this is, this is, this is a simple enough investment exercise, but it, it's, it's, it's more complex than that, as you appreciate. Yeah, um, okay. Um, other question that's come up from uh, two people, I think, as far as I can see, is in relation to um, your, you know, what, what you're kind of projecting forward in terms of maybe changes to age at slaughter um, and, um, it, and increased fertility, so more, more animals born in six weeks, potentially could lead to, you know, changes in the supply pattern of, of beef animals to the, um, to the factories for processing. Um, and could that then in, in turn lead to problems at the processing side, you know, bottlenecks um, at certain times of the year? Um, again, you know, we, we've done some work on this with the meat, with Chagas and the meat processing industry. Now, I know Paul Crossan and his team are doing a lot more work on this. But the simple answer to that question is no, Tom. You know, we might think that that's a concern or that's an issue. But the reality of it is, you know, if we look across, we're, you know, first of all, we have three genders, young bulls, steers and, um, and, and heifers. And we have effectively then, you know, three key systems, finished off grass in the third summer, finished off grass in the second summer, now, except there's a point there, but there's also that finished out of the house um, in the, in the, you know, in uh, two years of age. But as you overlay the young bulls, the genders onto those systems, you can actually still ensure uh, a very, very consistent supply of beef. You okay. know? And, 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 and that's the key point. Even, you know, even, even with your proposed future changes? Even with the proposed future changes, absolutely. And, and what, what role then, what role, another question then, what role then do, uh, the, do factories and the processing sector have in perhaps incentivizing or encouraging uh, beef producers to shift uh, their... their uh, Look, they, 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 they have a key role and it's not just... Uh, it's not just beef processors. I can make an argument that it's also dairy pro- processors in the context of benefiting, you know, you know, the whole dairy beef integration piece. But, but I mean, we all know that incentivization leads to, um, you know, um, um, benefits in terms of, you know, beneficial moves in the right direction. We saw, for example, you know, best example is, uh, you know, somatic cell count in our dairy industry, milk quality payments, you know, they created the, the momentum for change. Hmm. If we look at it in on the beef side, the premium brand status around Angus and Herefords, I mean, they created a massive change there. Hmm. So there's a new opportunity here, obviously around earlier finish. And uh, certainly, you know, I think what will be crucial there is if we can help to promote that. And that's why the science-based tools become key because the last thing that we want, Tom, as you would well appreciate is people chasing a bonus and incurring higher costs. You know, they're going after the bonus and all of a sudden, you know, they're, let's say, wrong board lorry. They're pushing in more feed and fertilizer after, to go after a bonus and they're no more profit. And in fact, our carbon, our gross emissions is going mm-hmm. the wrong way, you know? So yeah. that's where these and, science-based tools go. And, 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 that, and, that, and that's, that was going to be a follow-up question of my own I was wondering about kind of um, incentives creating perverse outcomes and, and you've just you've just touched on it 
And I suppose, how can we prevent that happening, Andrew? Or are there ways of preventing that from happening or reducing that, the likelihood of that happening? I think, I think the ways we can do it, like in, in terms of the, in the finishing systems, I think there has to be a good understanding that the, first of all, farmers need to know the finishing system they're in, they're defined, they're the system they're in, and then work within the system. You know, and, and, and if we can then promote to that, those farmers the, the technical efficiency gains that he can get within his system or the opportunity to bring in a, a different type of animal into that system. And instead of, you know, the best example in that regard is, you know, the guys that are buying cattle in the, the sort of the store time to put them to grass to finish off grass in the third summer. What do we need to do to give those the guys the confidence to buy you know, eight, nine, ten month old cattle to finish off grass on the second summer. Mm, okay. There are additional technical, you know, um, needs there, which ultimately comes back to organizations such as yourselves and ourselves to fulfill. But every time we can do that, Tom, you know, that's that's two tons of CO2E. Mm. Every, uh, you know, mm. every yeah. 100,000 animals is 200 kilotons. Yeah. You know, five percent of our target. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll just go with one final question, Pat. Anyway, from the list that that's uh, on screen in front of me at the moment, and it's just maybe to go back, um, Andrew, to the EBI, and um, you had one particular slide that um, looked at the scenario where the the milk output was fixed, and then you had the the the, the second column then was was looking at um, a scenario where the output uh, was not fixed. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's stable uh, here. Yeah, sorry, a stable herd, that's what you called it, yeah. Yeah, so will, will you just, just go through that, just refresh um, uh, um, the, that stable herd scenario and the, that distinction between continuing to breed and use EBI and that is an enabling factor and then how EBI will change and bring in some direct impacts uh, on okay. using greenhouse gases. So, so the best way to think about it is, Tom, is as we breed on the current EBA, we get increases in, in, in fat and protein, mm. more productive cows, right? Mm. We're also getting a, a cow with better female fertility. So if we draw a line in the middle, you know, she is, we're reducing cost in that regard, you know, better female fertility, uh, lower cost in terms of feed and fertilizer, fewer replacements. But the problem that we have with the EBA currently as it's structured is that the, as we get the more growth and output, we need more feed and fertilizer to support the growth and output. Okay. So the gains you're getting at the bottom end in terms of having less cost of feed and fertilizer for fewer replacements, etc., are actually being lost because you've actually more output and you need feed and fertilizer to support the more output. So you're effectively at almost a net zero gain. Mm. So what we actually have to do in that scenario, there's two options you can have. One is you, just reduce down the weighting on the output piece. You don't need as much feed and, for, and shift more onto the, what's in underneath the line, the female fertility piece. So fewer replacements, more compact calving, and, and, and obviously less feed and fertilizer required. And that's effectively the carbon sub-index, okay? And then the second part of that then is the one that is the real opportunity then is, is obviously the direct selection for for, for methane, because as you've rightly identified, you know, at some point in time, you've gone as far as you can with the female fertility, you know, mm. and, and that's a wee bit like the aged slaughter discussion as well. So that's mm. where the direct selection for lower methane animals becomes crucial. But really, you know, to be honest, farmers won't really start to see the benefits of that. It's going to be 20, look, it's five years from now, you know, it's, it's but they'll certainly by the time we hit 2030 and we'll start where we finished, Sorry, we'll finish where we started ICBF. You know, it's 20 years, it's 15 years, EBA 2005. You know, in 15 years, 10, 15 years time, people will look back and say, you know, geez, I can't actually believe, you know, we used to have six ton, you know, cows and six tons of CO2E, and now they've actually only five tons of CO2E in their lifetime. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So can I... Can I summarize then um, just um, as a way of finishing my contribution, the, the, the recommendation for dairy and beef um, um, farmers, um, beef suckler farmers, um, is number one, to um, be clear in the system that you're in and then optimize your performance within that system. 
And then secondly, in the future, you will have the opportunity to directly impact on the methane uh, produced by your breeding animals. So you can choose to, to bring in lower methane producing animals into an, an efficient system. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's a two-step approach. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Okay. And thank you very much, Tom. And uh, th thank you, Andrew, for a, a really challenging and, and illuminating presentation. And it kind of puts... I suppose a perspective on, on where we need to go and, and asks as many questions of the industry as it answers in some ways in that in that uh, you're giving us a technology but but we have to apply that technology to actually achieve uh, uh, reductions in, in 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 gross emissions not just in 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 footprint and and that's where I think that the, a, a huge element of this challenge is. Uh, next week we will be continuing on this uh, uh, in this area, and we'll have uh, Nikki Byrne from Chagas Grange who will be talking about the role of genetics in helping address uh, greenhouse uh, as or sorry the added value of using high merit uh, beef sires on the dairy herd. Uh, apologies there. Uh, so that's that's next Friday morning at this at the same time. Uh, before I leave, I'd just like to, to thank our production team of Andy Boland and Andy Von Maher, uh, who uh, continue to to uh, put together the, the, the program and and uh, produce the, the program. So thank you very much and enjoy your your bank holiday weekend. And we hope to see you back again next week. And thanks again, Andrew and Tom.